Hello and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. If you were trying to uh, figure out the success or failure of the Trump disadministration so far, and you're only looking at the activities of the White House, you might be uh, inclined to say it's been a failure because he hasn't accomplished policy one yet in the, the uh, months that he's been in office. But if you were to look at some of the various cabinet departments where there are some competent, if brutally evil, people in charge, you would find out that a lot is changing behind the scenes. And that's what we're going to talk about on this month's Other Voices, in particular the Department of Justice, or as we're calling it for this program, the Department of Injustice under Jeff Sessions. Joining me to uh, try to figure out what's going on behind the scenes, I'm really glad to be joined by two people that I'm welcoming back. Dan Mayfield, it's been a long time since you've been up here Thanks. for this program. Dan is, began private practice in 1981 uh, as an attorney, primarily in the area of criminal law. He's a former member of the Criminal Law Executive Committee of the Santa Clara County Bar Association and he is a member of the National Lawyers Guild, which recently named him the 2017 Champion of Justice uh, by their San Francisco chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. Dan, thank, welcome to uh, Other Voices. Thank you. And Judge Ladores Cordell, welcome back. Always glad to have you here. Uh, judge Cordell is a retired judge of the Superior Court of California and former independent police auditor for the city of San Jose, former Palo Alto City Council member. She was assistant dean at the Stanford Law School where she helped develop a program to increase minority re in recruitment. Within a year, Stanford Law School went from last place to first place in enrollment of African American and Hispanic students among major law schools. Judge Cordell has received numerous awards and prizes for social activism and breaking race and gender barriers, including the Rose Bird Memorial Award from the California Women Lawyers Association and the Rosa Parks Ordinary People Award from the NAACP. Judge Cordell, welcome back. Really Thank you so much, Paul. Glad here. to be here. Rosa Parks Ordinary People Award. I never think of you as an ordinary person. Oh, sure. Person. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get started with um, just the big picture. Um, a lot of people have the sense that, you know, the Justice Department is in charge of a raft of government attorneys. I don't think they have an idea of just how deeply into our society its uh, roots go. So let's, let's talk about the scope of their responsibilities, how they impact our lives, our society. Who wants to sure. bite so first? Why don't we do this? Why don't I just kind of give a, a little history? And I think, Dan, you could maybe talk about what kinds of areas that the Justice Department covers, uh, if that's okay. So, sure. so right. historically, um, well, first of all, the, the Justice Department is led by the United States Attorney General, uh, who's nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, and is a member of the Cabinet. The Attorney General is seventh in line in succession to be President. Uh, the, the present attorney general is Jeff Sessions. He's 70 years old. He's five foot four. Uh, <laughs> he uh, is worth about seven and a half million dollars. You have done your homework. <laughs> um, so, um, the first attorney general um, was, his name was Edmund Randolph, and he was a wealthy Virginia lawyer. Um, and he was appointed by President George Washington. Um, and it was a part time job. So he basically had his law practice, and then he could go over and hang out a little bit and be the attorney general. Um, so most people don't know that there were two departments of justice, however. The first one was created in 1861, just before the Civil War, in February 1861. And it was created by the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America. And under that Justice Department, there were four attorney generals, one of whom was from Alabama, 
and owned 179 slaves. So once the Civil War ended, the Union prevailed, then it was Ulysses S. Grant who in 1870 signed the Judiciary Act that created the Justice Department. Um, so one interesting, th another interesting fact historically about this is that the Justice Department created in 1870. By 1871, the Justice Department was inundated with prosecutions of Klan members. In 1871, one year after it was established, 3,000 indictments and 600 convictions of Klan members. And some of these were the ringleaders, you know, the Grand Wizards, who ends up going to, they went to, to federal prison for terms of five years or more. Um, 1873, the, there is a moratorium. They just put a halt to prosecuting Klan members because there were too many prosecutions for the Justice Department to handle. They didn't even have enough lawyers to go after them all. Um, so the, the mission of the Justice Department, and this is from their website, to enforce the law, defend the interests of the United States according to the law, to ensure public safety against threats foreign and domestic, to provide federal leadership in preventing and controlling crime, to seek just punishment for those guilty of unlawful behavior and to ensure fair and impartial administration of justice for all Americans. And finally, its motto, it is, their motto is a question, and it's in Latin, translated in English, it is, who prosecutes, who prosecutes on behalf of Lady Justice? That is yeah. their motto. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you forget that, that they're, they're everywhere. I mean, that you say, well, who are they? Well, they're everything. That, um, all these groups that we think about as being autonomous are actually underneath the Department of Justice and then ultimately under Sessions. So the FBI, now even though the FBI does, as we're going to talk about, I'm sure, uh, have some independent powers of investigation as we've seen, uh, <laughs> they're, they're under uh, Sessions. The Drug Enforcement Association, uh, uh, administration, pardon me, is under Sessions. The uh, as we're going to be hearing an awful lot about lately, uh, is the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, part of the Department of Justice. They have a whole section on the rights of women, which has been basically gutted, but it, it's their name. Uh, there's a tax section that <laughs> just goes on and on and on. Uh, and then after uh, the formation of uh, uh, after 9-11, uh, all this information came out about how they have to work with other agencies, et cetera, and in particular the Department of Homeland Security, so that uh, they have these so-called fusion centers. Uh, we don't want to get off on the fusion centers too much, but let's just recall that locally the fusion center uh, has been in, involved in, in uh, investigating uh, groups like the Raging Grannies. Uh, <laughs> The, the, there's a fusion center in every state, and they are almost always involved in really, really crazy right-wing stuff. Um, what were they investigating the raging grannies for? Uh, you know, I, for being I, the raging grannies. Abuse of music, or <laughs> lyrics or something. You know, I don't remember what, it, what the actual problem was. I'm sure it had something to do with being uh, anti-war, but... The, no doubt. But they, they, they were doing it. So just, just a couple of more things. The attorney general can be removed from office by the president or by impeachment. And finally, there have been 84 attorneys general. Um, and of that number, two have been women, Janet Reno, Loretta Lynch, appointed by Democratic presidents, and two African Americans, Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, appointed by Democrat president, one Latino, and that was Alberto Gonzalez, who condoned torture, appointed by a Republican president. What about, um, you mentioned Sessions' height <laughs> and how much he's worth. Uh, a little bit of history on him. He's, he's a longtime Washington politician. Well, let's start with his name. <laughs> uh, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. 
<laughs> so now, and this is really true. Now you'd think, oh no, th you can't. This can't be true. Uh, the <laughs> Jefferson is for Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederate States. Beauregard was the general who fired on Fort Sumter. Uh, <laughs> Sessions, obviously, his family name. He's Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the uh, third. So that's, I mean, he's already a loser. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, probably people probably know this, but he he was a U.S. attorney uh, in Alabama, and he got a, uh, and the way he was uh, suggested by to be a federal judge, and one of the few people was actually turned down for a federal judgeship. So that, uh, and that, that's a very interesting hearing, but just face it, they, they went after him because he was such a racist. Uh, he then ran for Attorney General of Alabama, uh, and then ran for Senator, and he was a Senator for almost 20 years that, uh, that uh, was an early supporter of Trump, uh, which is, makes it very interesting how he was the first, one of the first. They he was the first Senator to and um, board. That it, considering that Trump is willing to go after him now, it, that, I find that very interesting. Uh, the, and of course, there's the very famous quote about how he uh, liked the Ku Klux Klan until he found out that they smoked yeah. marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you've got to have your, uh, your bottom line, I guess, or something. You, you mentioned the... Uh, Trump and Sessions being on the outs. What do you make of all this? And, and the fact that after all this abuse that Trump has sent via Twitter Sessions' way, then a major thing like the repealing DACA, he sends Sessions out. Well, I mean, I don't think they're on the outs, quite frankly. You I don't. think Trump just goes day to day. He's impulsive. Um, Jeff Sessions, since he's been in, has been undoing everything everything that, that President Obama put in place and been doing it very quietly. And we're going to talk at some point That's, about the kinds yes. of things he's done very stealthily. So I, I don't believe they're on the outs. He decided he wanted to be the Attorney General. He was going to do whatever Trump wanted to do. And he just took all the abuse Trump was throwing at him. Uh, he wants this job and he's doing exactly what Trump wanted him to do. And he's also, I, the, the DACA thing, I think he was a natural choice because he was one of the leading voices in the Senate against any kind of immigration reform. And, and that speech that he gives uh, about DACA is, is uh, part of his whole change that he's made in the, the Justice Department. Because it was basically, he came out and he said, um, well, what is it that you don't understand about illegal? They're illegal, so this is illegal. And that, that, that was, you know, that was his speech. Uh, and he's made that same change uh, as Attorney General in terms of the charging policies inside the department. So that uh, he's, rather than the local U.S. attorneys being in charge of charging, he says that charging is going to be directed from Washington. And when you charge a case, uh, when you prosecute a case, you will charge everything that you can, every possible charge to the fullest extent, and then at sentencing, you will argue for the fullest extent of uh, punishment for it. And it, it just is exactly, in my mind anyway, exactly the same uh, philosophy that, that he applied to, to, to DACA. That, now, what I find interesting about DACA is I think, I think uh, that I think Trump kind of set him up, sent him out there to, to do it. And because uh, uh, then a couple days later, Trump announced and said, uh, oh, well, maybe we're going to work something out. Yeah. <laughs> and I sort of think it was punishment for the, the whole thing around <laughs> I, I Russia actually, and the... Yeah. I actually disagree. I think Trump sent Sessions out to make the announcement about DACA because he was, he, Trump was too much of a coward to do it himself. So he knew he was going to get all this blowback and all this heat. And so he sent out his little minion to yeah. take care of it. And, and I really think that's what... <laughs> Why yeah, it? yeah. Uh, I, I I tend to agree with you, uh, Judge Cordell, that uh, he didn't want White House fingerprints on this because he knew it was not going to be very popular. Not that he cares about that except for his base. Well, let's let's get into some of the other changes that, that are underway. Um, we've just 
had all this uh, brouhaha over the NFL and players kneeling in protest. What they're kneeling in protest of is uh, police brutality, police killing of African American uh, pe unharmed people. Um, that discussion got lost, but that really and that's so that's still a very lively topic uh, around the country, and. One of the things that the Obama administration did a lot was, uh, under Eric Holder, was um, the idea of consent decrees with uh, local police departments that had terrible rights records um, within, within their own departments. And one of the first things, that's, one of the very first things that Sessions announced when he uh, took the office was he was going to review all the dissent decrees that were out there. So. Yeah. Judge Cordell, could you talk about consent decrees, sure. what they are, and, and what he's changing? Sure, and just very briefly. Um, so a consent decree, well, first of all, there are 14 police departments that are under, operating under consent decrees today. And all of those agreements are now in jeopardy because of just Sessions' Justice Department. Um, so what's a consent decree? Uh, police departments and the cities in which they operate um, are under an agreement, they enter into an agreement with the Justice Department. And they do this only after the Justice Department has conducted an investigation, usually because of a high profile killing of some sort. So they come in, they do an investigation, and then they only engage in consent decrees when the Justice Department finds that there is a pattern or practice of biased policing on a wide scale. So we're not just talking about, oh, there's one bad cop in the city and we're going to have a consent decree. That's not the way it works. There's a pattern. That has to be, and it has to be widespread throughout the department. So as you noted, on March 31st, 2017, Jeff Sessions issued a memorandum. And it's a titled Memorandum for Heads of Department Components and United States Attorneys. And I'm just going to pull out one sentence, and it's on the second page of the memorandum. And you can get all of this online. And if you just even put the date. Um, but it's dated March 31st, 2017. So what he has ordered, he's the, he has ordered that there be a, an immediate review of existing or contemplated consent decrees. That's just part of this memorandum. So it means com so existing, meaning they're already in operation. They're, yeah. they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do, yeah. which is reform. <laughs> right, right. And it, he's ordering a view of those, which means maybe he's sending a message, you know, we're just going to negate them. We're going to rescind it. And he said, contemplate it. So there's some places, some cities, some police departments where investigations were begun and they started entering in negotiations for consent decrees, but then the Obama administration ended. So the negotiations continue, but now it's under the Trump administration and Sessions, Sessions is saying, mm, maybe not, right? So there are 14 police departments right now. And let me just give you just the names of a few, uh, Miami, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, Cleveland, Ferguson, Baltimore, and I didn't know this one, East Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> and that was a federal consent decree in 2012 after an investigation found a pattern of police discrimination bias against Latino residents who said they were subjected to false arrests, uh, illegal searches, and in East Haven, Connecticut, four white police officers were convicted of using uh, you know, force, brutality. Um, and so a 2014 federal report said the town has made remarkable progress, including a reduction of the percentage of police stops of vehicles involving Latinos. This is the kind of thing you were directly involved in as the independent police auditor in San Jose. Right, I mean, we it's didn't engage in consent decrees, obviously, but we engaged in looking at and, mm -hmm. and trying to assure people that there was not any kind of bias in policing and to hold police accountable. So these other cities, Seattle, New Orleans, and of course Chicago. Now what's interesting, one thing in Chicago, so this is where, this is important to have a consent decree that deals with police reform in Chicago. But, but Sessions is saying, uh, maybe not. So what happened in Chicago? A woman named Lisa Madigan, 
And who is she? She is the state attorney general. She filed a federal lawsuit, and she filed it against the city of Chicago seeking a court-enforced consent decree to reform police training and to get accountability and oversight. So the state's lawsuit would do what the Justice Department has backed away from or will back away from. So it's just wonderful that the state's attorney generals are stepping up and saying, we know this is the right thing to do. The federal government is not behind us. We're going to have to take care of this ourselves. What is the, the actual on the ground effect of, of one of these things where the city, the city leaders, elected leaders of, of the city have agreed to these reform procedures. Is he proposing that they just pull the federal people out entirely and let them go back to the old ways? Or? Well, I mean, the federal people aren't there yeah. on the ground all the time. What they've done is negotiate an agreement. Everyone signs on saying, yeah, we're going to make these changes. We're going to have better education of police. We're going to do community policing, all of those things. And sometimes it's costly. Sometimes, right. you know, when the feds say, you know, there's going to be a consent decree, sometimes it really costs millions of dollars. And that's coming out of state coffers, but it's the price you pay for getting, you know, getting, making things right. So what what the message we're getting from the Trump administration, and more specifically from Sessions, is we don't care. We think that, and, and you know what, Sessions, this is really interesting, in his own words, he said this at his confirmation hearing about consent decrees. They undermined the respect for police officers. Right. He was talking right. about the lawsuits that give <laughs> rise to the consent decrees. Because you have to, you know, usually there's a lawsuit or there's a, you know, a big investigation because yeah. they're invited in. Uh, these lawsuits undermined the respect for police officers and create an impression that the entire department is not doing their work consistent with fidelity to law and fairness, and we need to be careful before we do that. No, so, no. So he's going on the uh, one rotten apple theory. Yeah, uh, sure. You know. And it, the consent decrees don't occur in those situations, exactly. as you explained. They have to find a widespread pattern of abuse. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Or and, discrimination. And, it, and again, it's, it's part of this whole thing of making everybody come to Washington. That uh, rather than the local U.S. attorneys being in control of the consent decree and um, monitoring it, finding out if it's being complied with, maybe changing it, uh, he's saying, oh no, everything's going to come back to me. It's all going to come back to Washington. And we're going to decide, and of course he's leaning towards, we're going to get rid of it. He's going to go back to where yeah. it was, yeah. which is very scary. One, one last example. There were fatal shootings of seven black men and women and teenagers in Miami in eight months. An eight-month period, right? Fatal shootings. And so that resulted in a consent decree in 2016. That decree, that decree will run through 2020. Now, what does it do? It requires improved training of officers are on the front line, reduction of these tactical squads, you know, the SWAT teams, right, that tend to be more aggressive, and it requires better internal investigations of officer-involved shootings. So that's in place. They're complying with it, I suppose, but it ends 2020, and we're looking at it just stopping now. Does he give a reason for this? Is it a state's rights sort of thing? Because he... On one hand, he says, you know, the state should have the power, and as Dan just pointed out, everything, he wants everything to run through Washington. I, I think we just heard the reason for it. I think, I think the, the reason is uh, his version of the rule of law, that he says the, the rule of law is me and the police, yeah. <laughs> and in that order, and, uh, <laughs> and we don't want people who show... Uh, contempt for that version, that idea, that ideology. Yeah. So, Speak no ill of the, any police department, that's right. apparently. Yeah. Um, Dan, you alluded a couple of times to the, uh, the sentencing changes and uh, guidelines and, and charging various uh, uh, crimes and things. Uh, you're a criminal defense attorney yourself. I know you don't normally work on federal charges and all this stuff. We're just enforcing federal, federal law. Um, but 
Would you expand on that a little bit? What's happening around sentencing? Well, the, the same thing, and, and here, I'll hold it up here. You can all read it from way out there. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> uh, available on the Attorney General's website uh, is the change in charging and sentencing policy. You can just go to the website and download it, and there it is. And uh, um, that I was actually in federal court just uh, yesterday. Oh. <laughs> First time in a long time. I, I don't stay there very often, but the, the uh, but let me just read in regards to this thing about going to the center. Uh, he says that uh, that the uh, the first is a core principle that prosecutors should change and pursue the most serious, readily provable offense. And then he says this. He says. Any decision to vary from this policy must be approved by a United States attorney or assistant attorney general or a supervisor designated by the United States attorney or assistant attorney general. So in other words, that, that it's, it, all, it all comes back to the center, making a decision at a lower level, making a decision to, to charge or prosecute um, that uh, based on, uh, shall we say, somebody's background, uh, their their youth, their uh, the uh, circumstances of the crime, is not going to be made at the lower level. It, it's going to all come back uh, to Washington, and that you have to um, get approval if you're not going to charge. And the the language is the most serious, readily provable offense. How is that a change from the previous policy? Was there, the, I, I, I'm not really sure what it means to go after the, the, the worst charge. I would think prosecutors normally would do that. Well, what, what you're looking for, hopefully, in a prosecutor is uh, looking for justice. Now, justice ends up being a lot of different things, but, but let's say, what if justice involves uh, no jail and a whole lot of volunteer work and um, uh, psychological counseling? Okay. So you can't necessarily get to that if you've charged certain crimes, because certain crimes, especially federal crimes, have mandatory minimums. You know, the federal crimes in particular say um, you will go to prison, and <laughs> that in prison it will be no less than blank years, four yeah. years, five years, twenty years. Um, and so, if you charge the uh, uh, most serious offense, you have eliminated the possibility of actually working to change. The perpetrator and yeah. hopefully yeah, a more caring sentence. Uh, and, yeah. well, from my point of view, stopping crime in the future. But I, I think it also means that he's sending a message: we're not going to plea bargain. So most cases, state and federal, get resolved through plea bargains. And I, I don't want to understate that. So in just the states, it's not the feds, big majority, ninety-six percent of criminal cases are plea bargained. All right. That's a lot. So our system would explode if every criminal case went to trial. It would explode because there aren't enough judges, there aren't enough courtrooms, there aren't enough lawyers. Plea bargaining has come in. And I think the message coming through on the federal level is no plea bargains. Charge the most crimes you can to get the highest punishment and just lock them up. I really think that's the message in that memo. And, and this is kind of a reversal of where not only the Obama administration and Eric Holder was trying to take this, but there was actually a, a lot of uh, bipartisan sentiment in the Senate uh, for justice reform, and sentencing was, was one of the major things. But Jeff Sessions was the senator who most opposed that, That's was right. he not? Mm -hmm. That's right. 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 <sighs> Let's continue on <laughs> this happy list. <laughs> a lot, lot of injustice out there. Man. Um, Dan mentioned at the outset that the FBI is um, one of the larger agencies under the purview of the Department of Justice. And there's certainly um, a lot going on uh, with the FBI, including the Russia investigation, 
which is still officially under the Justice Department, even though Jeff Sessions has recused himself from the case because of inconveniently lying to the Senate about his involvement in it. Um, and along with that, there's the possible firing of uh, Robert Mueller, the uh, special counsel. Is that the right term that they're using? Special counsel, I mm -hmm. think. Um, anything, I guess he hasn't, Sessions hasn't interfered in, as far as we know, in the uh, Russia investigation. But in terms of, um, say Mueller starts indicting people very close to Trump, and Trump wants to fire him. How does that work? He fires him. He, he can just... fire him. We've seen that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be very hard for him to fire him. Uh, that uh, the, the politics of it at this point are, are pretty clear. Um, but uh, I, I think the he's Senate, just gone. But isn't the Senate, I think there's some members of the Senate working on a bill to prohibit Trump from being able to to fire Mueller. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah, the, there, there is a bill. And that's it's, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it's being on. worked on. I don't that's think right. it's actually written yet, but right. it, it would it but, would still allow the firing. But uh, as I understand it, Mueller could go to a panel of judges and appeal his firing. And there would be a 30-day period there where nothing, nothing would happen. Um, I, it sounds complicated, which is why they're probably still, still writing it. Right. Um, and this may not be related, but in thinking about uh, Mueller and uh, James Comey getting fired, uh, there's the, the question of uh, pardons, which is not directly related to the, the Justice Department, or maybe it is. Um, well, it is. No, that, it's okay, one, it's then, one, then one then of the sections me. here is the, the Office, is of, the of, office pardon, of Pardons. Pardon attorney. This Office of Pardon Attorney, that's what it's called. Okay. Uh, so just, just briefly, Article 2, Section 2 of the United States Constitution says the President shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. There is the Office of the Pardon Attorney, and it's the Pardon Attorney, and then there are staff there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they do more than issue pardons. And they don't actually issue them. What they do, there's this umbrella. We'll call it executive clemency. And under it, there's pardons, there's uh, clemency, there's, um, sorry, um, commutation of sentences. So if somebody gets a 50-year sentence for possession of a small amount of drugs, a president can commute. And if it's a federal prosecutor, it's all federal crimes, the president can commute the sentence, can make it two years or just say the sentence is done. Um, like Obama did with Chelsea. That's right, exactly. Well, and with a whole lot of drug cases. Yes. I mean, there's, that's there's right. Exactly. A whole lot of drug exactly. cases. And that was related to the harsh sentences that they were trying to reduce under, right. under Eric Holder. People were sentenced in the 90s. That's right. Yeah. So, so what Trump didn't do is what the department is set up to do. So the office, the office is set up to do. The office is there. They take all requests for any forms of executive clemency. So we've mentioned some of them, reprieves and uh, you know, commutation of sentence and pardons. They are responsible to review the petitions, because you have to, someone has to petition first to get a pardon. Then they investigate, they prepare a memorandum, they make a recommendation from the Justice Department to the president, and then um, the Office of the Pardon Attorney prepares all the documents that the president signs when granting any, whatever the form of clemency is. None of that was done With in the case Arpa of oh. Joe Arapaio, which is the first pardon issued by uh, Trump. So Ar that procedure Arpaio didn't was, even petition for that. No. no. So it was completely it. bypassed. None of it. The office wasn't even involved. And they were set up to do just that. Doesn't mean it's illegal. But the whole process has been set up to do this. You have, you know, there's a list. Again, it's online as well, clemency, clemency statistics. And in each instance, straight through the Obama administration, um, the, the, they utilized the procedure, but not with Trump. So um, I do want to uh, add that on October 4th, today is October Third. Third. <laughs> On October 4th, there, almost were, got me here. <laughs> there will be a hearing. There will be a hearing in Arizona in federal court, and it's a hearing regarding Joe Arapaio. That's tomorrow because he has filed a motion 
to, for the judge to dismiss his underlying conviction since he's been pardoned. Now, remember he was convicted in the aftermath of a class action lawsuit by Latinos who, who were proven to have been treated unconstitutionally, discriminated against, excessive force, racially profiled by the sheriff. So they won the lawsuit. The judge presiding over it then said, I'm ordering you to stop racial profiling. And did he stop? No. no. <laughs> so the plaintiffs in the lawsuit come back and say he should be held in contempt. So there was a criminal contempt hearing at which the judge took evidence and found that he was guilty of contempt. But because this was in a, this is criminal contempt, in a federal court, that gave the president the wherewithal, if he wanted to pardon Arapaio, he could. He did do that. Now Arapaio's coming back in to say, all right, I've been pardoned. Now I want to get rid of my record entirely. So you need to dismiss the underlying conviction. That's the hearing that's on October 4th. So, so the point is, is that you can still be guilty and pardoned. <laughs> that, uh, and, and there's, a, there's definitely a uh, an, an issue about whether, in terms of separation of powers, about the power of the judge to control the courtroom uh, and whether you can take that away through the pardon power of the president. That, uh, so and, and there's one other thing. This is, I love it, it's a female judge, which is great. I hope she does, continues <laughs> to do the right thing. Um, on September 14th, and it's Judge Bolton, B-O-L-T-O-N, she issued an order in, in anticipation on preparation for this hearing that's going to be tomorrow. So on September 14th, she issued an order citing a case involving Richard Nixon. It was Nixon versus the United States. In which Seems like a good precedent for this very administration. Good precedent, in which the Supreme Court suggested in that decision that a presidential pardon leaves intact the underlying record of conviction. So she ordered the Department of Justice to submit a brief addressing that. Now, what side is the Department of Justice on in this case? They're on Arpaio's side. They're saying that, yep, pardon was good, and the underlying conviction should go. So that's all scheduled October 4th. All right. Well, we'll have to have you back in the future and find out how, the, how this went. The, um, talking about who's going to be arguing what side, um, I, I don't want to go deeply into this, but I think it's worth noting that um, today, I think it's the first time it's ever happened. Um, at the Supreme Court, there was uh, a hearing over Wisconsin's redistricting of their, their voting districts. The and gerrymandering case. The gerrymandering yes. case. Yes. And um, Sessions had one of his attorneys there arguing against another government attorney who was there saying these this redistricting should be overturned because the Obama administration had opposed the redistricting. There are now three cases where that's going to be happening, where it's never happened before, where there will be two government attorneys arguing two different sides. One, the government position that was set up under Obama, and another government attorney arguing the position that Jeff Sessions wants. So that's, that's what we're up to. <laughs> it's like nothing we've ever seen. Yeah. No. And, and this entire disadministration is like nothing yes. we, have, we have ever it seen. It truly is. And, and very quickly about Wisconsin, if, if just the, uh, the Democratic Party actually won the, the popular vote in Wisconsin, uh, roughly 55%. Uh, but they only have 40% of the people <laughs> in the Wisconsin, Wisconsin legislation. So that uh, the idea of how the gerrymandering occurred uh, ends up being really, really important. And the, the argument by the state of Wisconsin, which I just love, was that uh, gerrymandering is as American as apple pie, that people have been doing it <laughs> since the beginning of time, at least in the United States. And, and so we get to do it just like everybody has ever done it before. And that, that was their argument. It was, that doesn't hold water with you? <laughs> Let's get our audience in on this. Uh, what we need you to do is raise your hand and wait for Henry to arrive with the microphone. 
And I'm told the microphone is being really cranky tonight, so if you have a question, make sure you hold it right up close to you. Well, we can repeat it. Uh, yeah, or we could try that, but we, we like to get it on tape so that when people watch it. So the first one's over here on the aisle and in the middle, so that's convenient. And if you would stand up and make it easy on our camera people, that would be great. Yes, uh, just to follow up on the Joe Apile pardon, if I'm not mistaken, he was only facing a six months contempt of court um, sentence. And so Donald Trump gave him a federal pardon for a six months. So absolutely outrageous. I mean, he hadn't even served the time. Anyway, just to add one more cherry on top of what you were saying. Right, he, had, he hadn't been sentenced yet. They were, were waiting for the, for the sentencing. I mean, it was all part of his trip to, to Arizona, and I'm, you know, uh, and he announced he was going to do it. Or No, he announced maybe he I'm implied, going to do it. He strongly implied <laughs> that he was going to do it. Yeah. Before he went, so that he could have his, uh, a big audience for when he came. So. Did he give up too much? Uh, I mean... This man, Trump, is going to do what he's going to do. Yeah. I mean, and, and um, he feels strongly aligned with uh, Sheriff Apio, and he wanted to protect him and show, you know, how big a guy he is. And so he did it. I mean, and it's outrageous. We all know that. And it may very well be legal. It may very well be lawful. Um, so I am hoping that, indeed, <laughs> that the, it is immoral. I am hoping that the underlying conviction is not dismissed because if it is, it wipes his slate clean. Arapaio has been is guilty of nothing under the law, so I'm hoping very much that that does not happen. Yeah, it, it's symbolic anyway. He had lost his re-election bid. Uh, it's not like he's going to be going out and applying for a job and have to put this record down on the application or anything. It, <clears throat> and symbolic in really bad ways. You say. All right, another question right here. And hold that microphone real close. Okay. Um, there are so many things that we've counted on the Justice Department to do, and among them <coughs> that I'm concerned about is the enforcement of voting rights. So I wondered if there were some things that you can already see Jeff Sessions and his version of the Department of Justice um, changing about the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act and access to the ballot? Well, I, well, the Supreme Court has on its own gutted the Voting Rights Act, a major part of it. Uh, so, I mean, it's well on its way to you know, just going back to not having it at all. Uh, and by gutting it, I, I mean, uh, just to refresh your recollection, there were certain states that had to, it's called a preclearance, they had to, had a history of discrimination uh, on, on voting issues and voting rights. And so if they were going to make any changes at all, it would have to go um, through the Justice Department and have to be cleared. And so the Supreme Court just basically said, nah, we're, we're done with that, got that, because we've made so much progress here, we don't need any of this. Um, so I, I don't know that Jeff Sessions needs any help right now. Uh, and also, as you know, Trump has appointed this voter fraud commission, blah, 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 which is... Uh, it's a farce. It truly is a farce. Um, and just to put it in perspective, 33,000 gun deaths a year in this country. Now listen to the number. 33,000 gun deaths a year in the United States. 31 cases of voter impersonation since 2000. And yet, we're told on the gun issue, we're not going to talk about guns. That's what happened. It's happening now, right? And on the voter 31 cases, what are they yelling? Voter fraud. Attention's being paid. So, I mean, it, it's, everything's been turned on its head. And I just don't, hope people don't get sucked into this. That commission is absolutely a waste of taxpayer money and yet another distraction. So, so there's the, the Ohio case uh, that where the Justice Department switched sides. We've talked about them doing it in other situations. Um, the Ohio case had to do with eliminating people from the list. Because remember how you have to register? <laughs> if you don't register, then you can't vote. And, and uh, Ohio is, ends up being, as we all know, a really, really important state 
uh, that uh, you always look to see which direction Ohio was going. Uh, and so the Secretary of State of Ohio uh, was wanting to remove people from the list. Uh, the U.S. Justice Department was saying, no, you can't remove them just because they didn't vote. Uh, and now they're coming back in saying, well, you're the Secretary of State, you get to do what you want. Um, the, uh, the other cases that we're going to see are the ones having to do with what is valid ID, where you have to show ID to vote. Now, you just by the way, in California, you don't have to show ID to vote. You do have to register, but you don't have to show ID to vote. But, uh, and I don't know how many states it is. I think it's a majority of the states at this point. Texas just lost in federal court about this. Um, I come from Indiana. Indiana has a, has a, uh, a must show ID to vote uh, law. Just very, very quickly, I took my mother, this was, she's 93 now. So this is about, it was Obama's first election, so nine years ago. Took my mother to vote with her next door neighbor. Um, the, my mother had managed to get a state ID card. Her next door neighbor had an expired driver's license. She didn't get to vote. Huh. The person operating the desk knew her. I promise you this. He said, Mildred, Mildred, I can't let you vote. <laughs> wow. But and know, that's the Indiana law. But you, but you know what this brings up? I mean, it is just bizarre in this country. We don't have a national voter law. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So every state gets to do what it wants to do. There needs to be a national voter law that basically sets it out and all the states have to comply. It makes absolutely no sense. Isn't it the Constitution that leaves it up to the states to come up with their own voting methods or something? I, I mean, you, you got me on that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know, but I, it, just is, it just does not make sense to me at all. Yeah, we've, we well, have almost as many we, we voting. We know the Constitution was kind of bad on who got to vote yeah. <laughs> when it started out. So. <laughs> And we're rapidly heading back to those days, it, it seems like. More questions in the audience. All right, you're starting to get your real pick of them here. So uh, Donald Trump has, uh, I guess, appointed maybe about a third of the people, you know, higher ups that he's supposed to have appointed. How about Jeff Sessions in the Justice Department? Uh, it seems like if uh, they're really uh, going to be uh, uh, trying that many cases, they're going to have to be hiring a lot of people. Is, is he staffing that thing up with uh, the kind of people that uh, we could expect him to do? Or is he following in Trump's footsteps on that score? One of the things he has done is that he has streamlined hiring of immigration judges for all the states along the Mexican border. Um, so look to find him filling positions rapidly in areas in which he can be the most punitive and areas that really pursue his policies. So for example, in the Office of Pardon Attorneys, when Obama was in, he was trying to fill 16 new attorney positions. And that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen in the Office of Pardons because that's not of interest to Mr. Sessions or to, uh, to Mr. Trump. Uh, so I, I think you can look, for example, and he doesn't have any say over this, obviously, but filling judicial slots. That's going along very quietly and quickly under Trump. So um, it, I, I think it just depends on what policies they want to pursue, and that's where they're going to move the quickest and spend the most money. Um, I, I do want to say something, again, about, you know, again, policy really drives what they fund and what they want to do. And most people don't know this, that there's a national commission on forensic science. And what it does, it gathers and it assesses evidence in crime labs all around the country. So it's no more funding. It's gone mm -hmm. under them, right? Now the reason for and, that um, go ahead. is very interesting because they've come out with several uh, uh, major studies recently that uh, have debunked fake science. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff that uh, having to do with uh, matching uh, bullet casings. So, the, and, and the, the, the committee says, well, you can't match bullet casings. They even had one on fingerprints. Everybody was totally into fingerprints. And then the commission, uh, said, and the, the commission says, you know, I don't think that, that fingerprints are exactly what you think they are. <laughs> and it's very subjective that uh, they did one on bite marks. There was a whole thing about bite mark business and being able to tell one person's bite from another. They can't. said you can't do that. 
um, there was, for instance, a, a, a series of, of cases having to say that they could identify the lead in a bullet as coming from a specific batch of bullets. So that they find lead in a dead person, for instance, uh, and then they find bullets in that person's house, you know, unfired ones, and they can say, oh, that lead came from exactly the same box of bullets. Not true. Uh, and so they've had a series of attacks on forensic, so-called forensic science, uh, and so therefore they're defunded. Right. Well, actually, I, I misspoke. They didn't defund it. What Sessions did was did not renew the term for the commission, so it's out. The other thing, which I just find startling, is that Sessions has suspended a review of FBI agents who gave false testimony in court. He just suspended, stopped it. <laughs> Does he bother explaining any of this, or just? Oh, come on, <laughs> come on! They have they, other things to do. They know? were re they were required to create what's called a Brady list, uh, and it has to do with this federal case called Brady. But but in any case, if 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 there was information that was favorable to the defense, the prosecution had to turn it over. So that if you knew that a person had lied in the past, then you had to go to the defense and say, uh, you know, that police officer in your case, um, he, we've had an instance where he lied. Um, for what it's worth, Jeff Rosen keeps a Brady list in the DA's office in Santa Clara County. Um, so by not investigating, then they don't get on the Brady list and you don't have to turn it over. Oh, there you go. Interesting. Thank you. So. <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of uh, things that we just don't know about. I'm, I'm really glad you both came down here. Let's get back to the audience here. All right. So there have been a lot of regulatory environments that protect worker health and safety that have been federally prosecuted and it's mines, it's asbestos exposures, it's been all kinds of different health and safety regulations that fall under the rubric of the Department of Justice to right. prosecute when they have willfully and knowingly, and you could do the Pinto and you know the cars, you could do tobacco, any number of those things. And what we're being told is that a lot of that regulatory environment is being rolled back to increase and enhance the ability of businesses to conduct more business and broaden and deepen employment opportunities here in the country. So I'm wondering <laughs> under, okay, it was a tongue in cheek. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't actually believe that. <laughs> no, okay. I know that. I okay, know that. So, I know you. <laughs> right. So, so the question I have is, what ability will, like class action lawsuits or groups who are exposed to those violations, what ability will they have to pursue those kinds of legal options in order to protect rights um, that heretofore had been uh, canonized in law? The Trump administration, the Trump administration has made it clear they don't like class action lawsuits. Um, so if, if regulations or rules are not out yet, they will be. Uh, I think some are out that are going to prohibit it. So that means an individual who feels aggrieved uh, would have to mount litigation. And the reason class actions are helpful to people, one, it covers a lot of people, a class of people. Secondly, it also less, lowers the cost because you're not just one person fighting the big system. So, I mean, I, all, you know, it's just not going the way we would like it to go in terms of it being helpful to people and using the court system as a way to, to make things right. That is not what's happening. So, I mean, my question I have for those of you here and those watching is, you know, what, what can we do, really? I mean, we could sit here, we can get very upset. I'm upset, uh, but what can we do? And let me just throw something out, and I really like you all to kind of think about it. Is that, you know, there are marches. You know, there's a tax march, the women's march, and I watch. I've, I've participated, but I've seen people come out who've never done it before and are feeling really good. They're out there holding their signs up, and I'm thinking, okay, that makes you feel good, all right. But I know after the tax march, Trump didn't reveal his tax returns. <laughs> They're still hidden. 
So I, I, I guess what I, where I am now, I understand emotionally how good it feels to be around people who think the same way and get out and march. But is that, is that really what we should be doing in, in, at this time? Uh, and, and maybe it's not an either or, but I just wonder how we should be spending our time. And I'll just throw one thing out to you, is that I absolutely believe that, well, first of all, we have to get, figure out why people don't vote in this country. We have to figure this out and figure out how we can get people to the polls. But the other is about being, running for office. I mean, on a local level, um, getting on commissions and getting things going from the local level. I, I truly believe in that. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot going on, I know, nationally, but um, I don't know. I, I just want to throw, some, throw that out to you to, to, to even get feedback from you, know, from you all, or at least to get you thinking about what, what do we do at a time like this, really, that, that starts to turn this stuff around? Because it's very frustrating. And I'm still frustrated after I go on a march. I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> what, what am I doing? So, uh, that's what I'd, I'd like us to, to think about going forward. I don't want us to leave here and leave this program and turn it off and say, wow, things are really messed up. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's like, all right, I, that's right. They've the worst they've ever been, probably. Uh, my mother is 94, and she said to me, I have never seen anything like this. And, and she's someone whose great-grandmother was a slave, okay? And she's telling me at 94, I, I've never seen any. This is just horrible, all right? So putting everything in context, what, what do we do? What should we be doing? Those of you sitting in this room, those of you watching. We're not going to have the time to really discuss this, oh, but we'll it. do it after the cameras are off. But I do have a follow-up question on that. Are you going to run for office again? Do I have a, a crazy <laughs> label on my head? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> I, have, I have run for office twice. Uh, successfully, one for the Superior Court um, and then one for the Palo Alto City Council. Taking and nothing it was, but small donations. I actually took no donations at all. None at all? No, I refused. Wow. Um, and it was my statement about campaign, against the whole campaign finance. Uh, but no, um, what I did have was, was voters who were, went door to door, I mean, work volunteers who went door to door um, to help out, but I took no, no money at all. Um, so the answer is no, I'm done. It's, not, it's, it's the next generation, and we really, you know, well, there's a lot to be done. All right. We're going to have to let it go there. My guests have been Dan Mayfield, criminal defense attorney and social justice activist, and Judge LaDoris Cordell, also a social justice activist. Thank you, Thank you both for joining us. Okay. Thank, Thank you all for coming. Thank you.